Salvation Now podcast, where you'll discover and be equipped with keys from the Word of God that will pave the way to God's unlimited blessing in your life. Now, here's your host, Evangelist T.J. Malkanji. talk about con- dumb confessions, dumb confessions concerning revival. And I know this is something that uh, strikes your spirit, especially going through Instagram, I mean, uh, Facebook and what's going, being pumped up on YouTube right now. There's a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage, doom and gloom preaching, talking about how hopeless the generation is, how lost they are, how lazy they are, nothing really good. And, um, so tonight we're going to eliminate that vocabulary from your mouth and we're going to we're going to impart a faith. You know, you can actually have faith for revival. You can actually have faith. you can use your faith for revival. Ezekiel 37 I believe is like a perfect scripture for that. God showed Ezekiel a valley full of dry bones. Not so Ezekiel can write a blog on how bad the bones were, how dry they were, <laughs> how dusty they were. Ezekiel right. write a blog, uh, start a YouTube <laughs> channel exposing all the bad pr- no The Bible says he told Ezekiel to then prophesy to the dry bones, which prophesy is speech done under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That's what it is. It's to to speak under the unction by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so he said prophesy to these dry bones so that they can live again. Don't, Mm. Don't prophesy against them. God was saying prophesy in favor. Prophesy their future, a bright future. Prophesy revival and resurrection life hitting that generation. And so that's what I believe that Ezekiel unction to to learn how to not be the devil's prophet and just speaking everything he wants you to say, but to really be the voice piece of God on the earth and speak things in line with Bible prophecy, which we know Bible prophecy doesn't say in the last days, everything's gonna go to hell and you know the Christians should just buy, build and buy a bunker. It says there will be deep gross darkness on the earth. It says there's going to be darkness that overtakes many people. But unto you, rise and shine, for my glory will be seen on you. Pastor Alex, take it away. You know, it's, it's good that you brought up that Ezekiel passage. Before he says prophesy to these bones, he says to Ezekiel, can these dry bones live again? Mm. And I love that. It's almost as if we're in a turning point in America where God is asking us, can this generation live again? You know, we'll get into it. There's a couple confessions that really have just irritated my spirit in the past couple months because I hear it all over, whether it be Instagram, you know, YouTube, people, doom and gloom. But there's a question that you have to answer yourself. You in the comments, can these dry bones live again? Answer that in your own spirit. Will we see another revival? Will we see another great awakening? Or is it just going to be a continuing Uh, spiral out of control because it's true we do live in what they call a postmodern society you know like that's that's everywhere people are like you know we live in a postmodern society that means like you know people aren't Christian we're living in a post Christian generation that may be true but it's up to us because we see all these things happening Roe v Wade being overturned these are things that key us off to, to think Maybe it's not true. Maybe this isn't the end of the world. Maybe we're going to see another revival before Jesus comes back. And it's, you know, it's funny. I used to say to the Lord, and I guess we kind of hit on this, so we'll we'll start on this one confession. I believe that's the best way to start it off. Um, I used to say to the Lord, thank God, because I knew from the age of 12 that I was called to to be an evangelist, to, you know, into the ministry. I, I knew that in my spirit very deeply. But I used to say to God, I used to say, Lord, thank God. Thank you so much that you didn't call me to youth pastor. And I was <laughs> serious. Like, I would say, like, God, thank, thank you so much that you didn't call me to youth pastor. And then, you know, about two years ago, he called me to youth pastor and started <laughs> youth and stuff. And ever since then, he's put this fire in my spirit for Generation Z that I'm telling you I did not have before. Like, I, I, I'm going to be honest, like, I, I'm not, su- I wasn't super spiritual, like, I believe that I'm going to see a shaking. I didn't really want to preach to young people. I didn't have that fire. I thought, you know, they're weird, you know, like, all this uh, 
gender ideology stuff is weird. I disagree with sure. it. So I just thought I was going to you know, preach to adults, I guess, or, or whatever, old people. But ever since like he switched that in my spirit, it irritates me when people say things, and I guess we'll start with this confession, Gen Z is going to hell in a handbasket. How many know Gen Z is going to hell in a handbasket and this generation so far gone and we'll never see revival? Have you seen what's going on in the news? Have you seen people are, are identifying as cats? People are identifying as furries and, and frog self and they're identifying as animals. How far gone this generation is? And it's, it's interesting to me because it really, it really irritates my spirit because um, God, you know, it, it's the same people, let me say it like this, it's the same people who say, we need to see revival again in this nation. We're going to see another sweeping of God in this nation. They'll, they'll get that all preached up and stuff. But then they'll turn in and say, you know, out of the same, out of the same mouth, how many know this generation's going to hell in the handbasket? Look what I saw on the internet the other day. It's like, yeah. you've got to pick one or the other. Is sure. this, is the, are we going to see a great awakening? Or are we going to see a, a massive uh, downturn of society? You've got to pick. Because you cannot say, you know, like how many are hungry for a move of God like we had in the, in the 50s, in the 40s, in the voice of healing. How many are hungry for that? And then also say like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what this generation is doing. <laughs> it's it's like, true. Yes, it looks dark in the natural. But you have to understand, the power of your confession is so powerful. God can't use you in an area that you've already uh, trashed with your mouth. That's right. If you've already trashed Gen Z with your mouth and said they'll never be saved, he'll not use you. And you'll just be, you'll just be one who like looks to the past and says, how great was that revival and this revival? And he'll never use you that way. That's very true. And you know what I'm reminded of in 2 Kings chapter 7, where Elisha prophesies that by this time tomorrow, there's going to be an economic revival. The economy yeah. is going to boost back up again. And then the expert, the analyst, you know, the uh, Christianity Today blogger, he said, even if the Lord should open up the floodgates of heaven, can such a thing be or such a thing cannot be? You know right. what happened? The next day, well, Elisha on the spot said, you shall surely see it with your eyes. You'll witness it, but you'll have no part or portion uh, in experiencing it for yourself or, or, or tasting of it yourself. The next day, he gets in charge with the distribution of the bread, which when you're distributing bread to a starving nation, it's like the worst job to have. He got trampled <laughs> over and he got crushed under their feet as they ran into the storehouse to get the food again. And the Bible says he, just like the word of the Lord said, he would, he would see it with his eyes, but he was disqualified from ever being a part or being used in it. And so God's saying, if you, if look, if you confess doom and gloom, it's not that God won't do it. God's right. still going to do it because he's going to use Jeremiah's. He's going to use mm -hmm. David's. He's going to, everybody was complaining about Goliath and how big he was. David said, I'll take his head off. But you know who got the reward? Not the people that complained, not Eliab, not David's brothers, not Saul. It was David that got the reward. So you'll That's surely right. see it. There's going to be a revival. It's prophetic agenda. God has planned in the last days, says God. I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh and young men. It doesn't just say old men, conservatives, you know, people that had values growing up. It says even young men will see yes. visions and old men will dream dreams. And in that day, I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth beneath. That's going to happen. I quoted right. it before, Isaiah 60, arise and shine for your light has come, that though deep gar darkness is on the earth, and growth darkness taketh upon the people, unto you, unto you, my light, my glory will be seen on you. But like uh, Pastor Alex said, you have to make a decision today. What side am I going to be on? Am I going to be on the side of those that are embarrassed, shrinking back? Because when God does move, I'm there saying, man, I never thought this possible. Yeah. Or are you going to be the one that's tasting and seeing that the goodness of the Lord is a real thing, that God doesn't abandon any generation and God doesn't have a different plan for this generation any different than he had uh, in Wigglesworth's generation or Eliza's generation. Right. Matter of fact, the gen it, as we approach the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, as his return draws near, thing, the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, the move of the Spirit is not going to get less and less. That's why I've Amen. never gotten along with cessationists because they teach that as, you know, 
the, the, the apostles died or the arrival of the canon of Scripture that the gifts of the Holy Ghost have seized because we don't need those things anymore. We have the Word now. There's nothing that teaches that in Scripture. We actually see the complete opposite. Malachi 4, in they, indeed the days are coming where the oven will be burning hot and the wicked will be burnt and will be ashes under your feet. But unto you who fear my name, that's us, that's me, that's you. Unto you that fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with what in his wings? With healing, with healing right. power, with the yeah. demonstration of the gospel. Our generation doesn't need another explanation of the gospel. Our generation needs a fresh demonstration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe that God is raising up people from this broadcast. You that are watching right now, you could have been born in any generation. You could have been born in Elijah's day. You could have been born in Peter's day. You could have been born in the 1600s. You could have been born in Charles Finney's day. But God saw it fit to put you on the earth for such a time as this. And you're not on the earth to complain about the state of things. You're not on the earth to pretty much be a mouthpiece. You know how Jesus turned to Peter when he was speaking for the devil, he said, surely those things will never happen. Jesus turned to Peter and said, hey, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because Peter was lending his, his voice to the devil's opinion. Don't lend your voice to the devil's opinion. Speak scripture. Speak prophecy. Speak revival. And you'll have what you say. And that's why Amen. we talked about confessions tonight. Because it, it ultimately it boils down to that. It's, it's the, Pastor Alex said it perfectly. Your, 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 your confession will make or break you. It's going to make or break you. That's right. Go ahead. And, and that revival that you, that you speak of, we've already seen the beginning of it. We're seeing it now. And it's like, I mean, look, look, look at all these college campuses. Look at Asbury. You know, like, yeah. it was, I think this, it was very apparent when that happened, when Asbury started. How many people came out of the woodworks to give their two cents on this revival? And whatever you think about it, you know, <laughs> I made a video because I, I was like completely fed up with people saying like, well, you know, I'm going to expose the truth about Asbury. There was, there was a homosexual on, but it's like that was friends with this person. It's like people use their, their voice, their opinion, or, their, you know, to, to like tear down anytime God does it. It's like we've been saying we want this revival. Here it is. And now I'm going to take my voice and try to tear down what God's doing. It's like he's already doing it around America whether right. it be Asbury or all these universities. I mean, look at, look at uh, Christ for All Nations. In the last 30 or 40 years, they've seen 80 million salvations by one ministry. 80 million salvations. So to say God is not moving on the earth like he used to in the old days, he's moving far greater on the earth. That's right. That's such a, it's such, and I, and I think this evangelist TJ, it's such a Western idea that God is like, we're in this postmodern, post-Christian society. There's no hope. You know, like, let's just pray for Jesus to come. It's, it's such an American and Canadian, just a Western thing, because people don't see what's going on in Africa That's and right. in Nigeria and in South Africa, you know, and, and Tanzania. Like, God's moving so powerfully right now. And to say, like, oh, God, I guess God's done with those miracles. It's, it's such a narrow worldview. Look at what's going on in the earth. I, I am very optimistic about what's going on. I am so excited about what's going on. I'm not wishing that, I, you know, how, how great would it have been to be in Wigglesworth's day? Those miracles would have been great to see. <laughs> no, I'd rather be here, to be honest with you. I'd rather yeah. be here. God's moving now. Be, be, be someone, you know, because it wouldn't have happened in Wigglesworth's day if he didn't cry out to God. That's right. And there were people in Wigglesworth's day who were looking back to the, the, great, the first great awakening, like, oh, how great it would have been to be in the first great awakening and how, how mighty it was. And it's like, dude, there's something going on right now. Put, put your effort into it. Get on the train. Get in the flow of the Holy Spirit and watch how God uses you. Stop looking at the past. Stop being like, oh, how great. Just, just <laughs> look, to the, look to what's going on right now. I mean, it does irritate me. Like, to, to say that Gen Z isn't hungry for God, it, it really, it grates at my spirit because I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes, and it's such a lie that, that you know, like Gen Z, all they want to do is be on, be on Reddit and talk about, you know, like gender ideology. That's not true. Gen Z is fed up, fed up with being depressed, fed up with being anxious, fed up with always being sick. There's a, there's a hunger for the supernatural like never before. That's right. 
there's a real hunger. I know you've seen it in your meetings where there's young people who they're just trying to find something that will alleviate their pain. So they go to witchcraft or Wicca or, you know, whatever it is. When in reality, they've just never been shown the real, genuine power of God. And the minute they see it, like the miracle working power of God, it's like all out. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's actually like we're positioned perfectly for an unprecedented awakening. If you study the history of past revivals and great moves of God, three things, three things always preceded every major awakening. One was that there was an all-time fear of death that gripped the souls of that generation, which we mm-hmm. saw in the last three years. I won't say what it is for fear that they you know, flag my account or whatever, but <laughs> that virus, <laughs> it, it, it didn't bring the fear of death on people. It just revealed the fear of death. It, right. it opened up people's eyes to the reality that they were not exactly sure where they would go if they would die. They, their eternity came into question. You know, God has written, inscribed eternity on our hearts. And so when, yeah. when that virus came, it ended up a- awakening people to a question that they may have never even asked themselves before. Because when you're 18, 20, 22, 23, you know, you feel invincible. You don't feel, you feel like you can run through a, a, a nitroglycerin tank. And, I feel it you now. Know. I, just, I just crushed a whole Celsius. I feel like I can do anything. Yeah, you just, <laughs> is that that drink? Yeah, have you never had Celsius? No, I never have it. Oh, man, I got to get you I've on seen it. it. I've it. seen it on your uncle's broadcast, though. Oh, yeah, well, because I got him into it. I will take credit for that. Well, I'm going to have one when I come to Florida. I don't think we have that in Canada. It's probably Ben. It's probably like <laughs> Yellow 5, Yellow 6 in it or something. I don't oh, know. whatever. I love <laughs> Yellow 5. So they, I drink Yellow 5 for breakfast. <laughs> they, had, they, had, they had the all-time fear of death. Number two, extreme government corruption that was revealed. Uh, in every past historic revival. And so we saw that, uh, obviously, in the last three years, if you have, a new, if you have access to any news site, you can, you can know that the last three years, there's been a lot of politicians that have come up on corruption charges and are being charged for it, you know, with the Epstein thing. You know, that, that's a whole can of worms that's yet to be open, <laughs> but it will be open soon. Yeah. And then thirdly, there was an all-time decline in church attendance, like historic de- decline of church attendance, which we've seen right. that. If you look, do a quick Google sh- search, you're going to see that there's, there's an extreme decline of church attendance in a lot of places, especially in the last three years. But guess what? Look at the churches where they're leaving. They're not leaving Holy Ghost Spirit-filled churches. Those churches have actually sustained and stayed strong and have grown. Yes. It, the churches that they're leaving are the boring... I mean, I would leave that church. <laughs> the boring... And I've uh, walked out of many during religious, service. Religious, <laughs> cyclical, you know, liturgical, constant, just this this program type of yeah Christianity where it's like you can literally if if you just came in on an off Sunday, you got there forty minutes late, you'd be able to know exactly where they're at in the service because everything's so programmed, everything's so neatly done. Those cute little neat Christian services, people <laughs> people aren't buying that anymore. Because, you know, when they all shut their doors, when people were hurting the most, and then they were, you know, they were telling people, church is in your heart, you can have church in your living room, and then church is opened up again, and guess what? You're having a hard time bringing those people back. Why? Because you, at the, the moment where they needed God the most, where they needed ministry the most, where they needed the spoken word the most, where they needed laying the hand of hands the most, we, uh, a lot of places folded up and they shut down. They failed that test. And so a lot of those people left. So now we're primed for revival. We're primed for revival. And, you know, and the devil's agenda is to get you to look, to look at the negative circumstances, to look at the opposition, to look at what the WEF is doing, to look at Agenda 2030, what they're planning for the generation, to look at Hollywood and what they're grooming these stars to uh, impart into the next generation. You know, you look at some of the celebrities that they're, they're grooming up now, which is, a, you, you look at that, you see what they want implanted into your children, right? You can 100%. look at YouTube, the type of ads they have up now for children. So you can look on that and focus on that. You can talk about how big Goliath all you want. That's right. Or you can pick up a stone 
You can pick up the sword of the Spirit and actually conduct real spiritual warfare, which is not playing a banjo on a mountain overlooking your city. It's not, <laughs> uh, you know... Rend open the heavens. Tear them open. Open the heavens like that. Real spiritual warfare is conduct conducted one way. Yeah. Acts 8. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ yes. to the people. And so in the midst of the devil trying to get that generation off track... God is going to raise up, not just one Billy Graham, not one Smith Wigglesworth. I really believe that there's going to be so many people that carry magnanimous power with God that we're not even going to really care about names anymore. There's going to be so many that you, it, there'll be so many bunched up. There won't be one guy that stands apart by himself. There'll be right. so many power-packed preachers, women and men, that yep. will rise up. Uh, you don't even know people's names anymore. That, that's exactly right. God, God's doing it now. And it, and it really, uh, over 2020 and 2021, it really opened my eyes to see because you could see something flip in the eyes of like young people. Like during 2020, I, I would get texts like, oh shoot, this is real. Like the Bible's real. Like the, because they're seeing it play out before their eyes. And so that they're thinking, Oh, it's not time to play games anymore. I can't, I can't gamble with my life anymore. And that's why youth pastors, youth ministers, and I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to sound like an expert here. I've been, you know, I, did, I was a youth pastor uh, for, for under a year, and I'm about to start up this youth group here in Miracle Word Church, so I'm not by any means saying I'm an expert. But the word works. Don't, don't fall into this mindset that like, oh, I've got to dumb down my services. I've got to make it trendy. Hmm. I've got to make it cool and make it all surface level so that they get it because you know studies are showing that people's attention spans are really uh, short and because they're scrolling through TikTok all that much, they can really only take like a little bit at a time. I don't believe that. I really don't. I reject that completely. The Bible always works. So don't, if, if preaching is the thing that God has anointed, he didn't anoint TikTok videos, which we love technology. I mean like it, it we're using it right now. You know, like Evangelist TJ uses it. I use it. We all use it to broadcast the gospel, to, to push it, and That's people right. get saved that way. But you don't have to dumb down the gospel or the way we, we uh, give the power of the gospel to, to fit this culture. If, have have hour-long services. Have laying on of hand services. You know, like have anointing services. Have Pentecostal praise. You know, like let's not, let's not back off. Let's push forward. Anything that the devil doesn't like, let's do it. I mean, like, obviously he doesn't like long church services with young people shouting and dancing. That's the opposite of what he wants. Let's do that. That's right. That's right. Well, we covered the first confession, in case you missed it. It's my generation's too far gone, or Gen mm -hmm. Z's going to hell in a handbasket. And um, that's obviously not the case, as we've discussed. We were primed for revival. This generation, you know... It's easy. You know, Jesus looked to the peoples and the Bible says he saw them as sheep without shepherds. Mm. He saw them as distressed and dispirited. It doesn't say they looked like it. It just mm -hmm. says he saw them like that. Nobody else saw them like that because it's easy. You know, it's easy to put up on Instagram and TikTok and all that. Your highlights, which Gen Z, that's what they do. You know, everything's nice and dandy. But when you find out that 50 percent of Gen Z has confessed to have some sort of mental illness, some sort of anxiety disorder, 55%. And some stats actually say it's somewhere closer to 70% of Gen Z actually confess to have some sort of anxiety disorder, panic attacks yeah. or whatever. Do you understand? I read a stat the other day that the average anxiety level of a high school student today is akin to a, a patient struggling with psychosis in the 1950s. So, and you know, I've seen it. We just did a youth camp um, last year in the month of October, I believe it was. And we were out in the Philadelphia area. And I, I felt one night just to minister on deliverance from suicide, from a suicidal spirit. And I preached on Mark chapter five, the gathering demoniac and how the Lord set him free in one, one moment's time. He went from being untamable to now sitting clothed and in his right mind, and willing, not just that, he was willing to follow Jesus. He wanted to preach for Christ. He wanted to get on the road. He wanted to go into the ministry. 
So I preached on that, gave an altar call, and you wouldn't believe how many people came forth publicly, not even ashamed to admit it. I've I've got a suicidal tendency in my like I'm always thinking of killing myself. I'm always thinking of like depressive thoughts and thoughts of self harm. I mean the whole the whole row the whole first um, row of that altar call was just packed out with people that that needed deliverance in this area. And I laid hands on on them all, prayed for them. And uh, you can tell things were being broken. The next night, it was a three-day conference. The next night, two girls came up to me, and they were weeping. And they're saying, God delivered me from a suicidal spirit. I said, that's wonderful, you know. But then she rolled up her sleeves. She rolled up her sleeves, and her friends were with her to testify because they, they had seen, they knew her situation. They had seen the scars on her arms, all the scars on her arms. This happened in, this, this, I'm not talking about a story that happened in the Bible. I'm talking about a story that happened less than a year ago, six months ago, seven months ago. All her scars had totally disappeared and the Lord restored. Praise I really God. believe that's, that's like an illustration of what the Lord wants to do with this generation. That miracle just perfectly demonstrates the grand plan of God for Generation Z. That though there is a generation that thinks itself to be pure in its own eyes, that knows how to put up a smile, but carries a broken heart. Do you understand there's a proverb that says, even in laughter, the heart can, can be miry, the heart can grieve. Even in laughter, the heart can grieve. And so you're seeing a, a generation that seems to be laughing and mocking the things of God, but really there's a grieving heart. And I remember it was um, Ted Shuttlesworth Sr. that said this, he said, it, any harvest that you speak against, you actually lose something in the anointing to reach that, that, that people group. Yeah. So if you speak against a specific, specific people group, I can't stand Gen Z, I can't stand yeah. millennials, you actually yeah. lose something in the anointing that would empower you to reach those people for Christ. Yeah. And I, I don't know about you, but I wanna, I wanna guard that holy deposit of God. I, yes. I don't want to get to the end of my life and stand before God and him say, I wanted you to reach those people, but instead of actually speaking and using your life as an instrument for my glory, all you ever did was criticize. All you ever did. You know, you think of someone who could have criticized the people he was called to reach. Paul. Yeah. Paul, literally, left for dead, stoned, shipwrecked. Uh, I mean, you go through 2 Corinthians 11, all the things he went through from a people of a group of Jews that persecuted from city to city. And in Romans chapter, uh, I believe it's Romans chapter 10, he says, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for these people that have made my life on earth a living hell, my prayer to God for them is that they could be saved. That's the love of God. And I really pray that there be an impartation of the compassion of Christ that would hit your spirit tonight, wherever you're watching, where you will weep for your generation. You know, until you've wept for your generation, you're really not a candidate to criticize your generation or speak against them. And I'm telling you, yeah. when you weep for your generation, you will never criticize or speak against your generation. You'll carry something. You'll, you'll actually, like Pastor Alex said, you'll be irritated and stirred up when people start to say dumb confessions around you. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we'll, we'll move on to the next one. But it, that, that story that you brought up of the, the, the self-harm scars disappearing... It's so clear that it's it's very it's so clear that it's an attack of the devil, and it's not just like chemical imbalances. And I've been you know we, we've been saying this for years, you know, and it's not just chemical imbalances. It's an attack of the devil. But it's crazy because God's doing that same thing all over America. Like I, I've heard I've heard stories like that where like just recently people have have um, been praying for people with with suicidal you know like cut marks up and down the arm, and they're just completely leaving. It's like, just like you said, God is erasing the guilt and the shame of this generation. That's right. At exactly the same time, about seven months ago, there was a girl that, that uh, approached, we were doing like this online Bible study for last gen, and she was saying the same thing. She was like, Alex, could you pray for me? I'm going in for surgery tomorrow because I have self-harm scars on my arm that didn't heal right, and so they have to like regraft my skin or whatever. And I had just gotten the report that I had type 2 diabetes. Could you pray that God would give me the peace to withstand this or whatever? I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to pray that God gives you the peace through the mm -hmm. storm. I'm going to pray that God completely removes type 2 diabetes or whatever, type 1, from, from your bloodstream, and then th those self-harm scars are gone. Amen. So we prayed, we cursed these in Jesus' name. 
The next week she comes on and she says, Alex, you're never going to believe this, which is always funny. It's like, <laughs> well, actually, I do believe it. But she comes on, she says, I went to the doctor that next day. She says, they tested me for type 2 diabetes and it's, it, it, it's gone. My blood level are, are, are all the same. My insulin, I don't need insulin anymore. And she said, right when I rolled up my sleeve to do the surge, man, this gets... This, this fires my spirit. Right when I rolled up my, my arm to show the doctor to do the surgery, the self-harm scars were completely gone. Hallelujah. And, and that's just such a, it typifies what God wants to do. Those, those self-harm scars, those cutting scars that, that those girls that Evangelist TJ was talking about, the devil would love to use that as a reminder. Look, look at who you are. You're a cutter. You're, you're suicidal. He would love to show you, you know, make you feel shameful and, and condemned about it. But God just removes it completely. Such a testimony, and that's so powerful. God's doing something great. I hope that stirs your spirit up in the comments. If it does, it stirs my fire spirit up. I'll tell you that much. Let's go on to the next dumb confession that we hear people say. This one, this one's very dumb. People, people don't want to hear the word of God anymore, mm. and they're tough to reach. Mm. People don't want to hear the word. Pastor Alex, go ahead. People don't want to hear the word anymore. I mean, we covered this a little bit. In the last point, you know, people, people aren't interested in the Bible anymore. People aren't interested in, in the true gospel. That's why our church is so small. They're not interested in the true gospel that we preach. And, you know, it repels men. And, you know, how many know they hated Jesus, so they'll hate me too. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that notion, it's like, no, maybe you're just a bad preacher. Or like, you know, maybe, maybe you're just boring. Like maybe it's it's that because I don't want to hear you. Yeah, it's like I'm a Christian. I feel I'm I'm training to be in the ministry right now. I love the Word of God, and your voice irritates me. So it's like (laughs) how much more like a sinner who who detests the Bible, you know, like wants to hear your voice. So that's exactly right. It's like the churches that have, and this is you you said this before. It's not the word that's repelling people. It's the deadness. It was my uncle's grandfather who said this phrase, all spirit, all word, no spirit, you'll dry up. Yeah. All spirit, no word, you'll blow up. But the spirit and the word, you'll grow up. All word, no spirit, you'll dry up. All spirit, no word, you'll blow up. Both spirit and word, you'll grow up. We need both. One of the things that as a young person, I can look back and say, this is the thing that, that drew me to the ministry. I, I, have, I grew up in a Christian household, but w- there was something about when I would sit in my uncle's services, evangelist uh, Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. I would sit there and I'd say, there's something, I don't know what it is, like I can't, I can't describe it. There's something about this that's not like anything I've ever experienced. There's something about the, it's not just passion. It's not just, it's not just being really convicted about your message and really selling it to the people. It's not that. It's not right. good communication skills, though he has them. It's the anointing that makes the difference. Right. It's the demonstration. I would sit in uh, evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth Sr.'s uh, meetings. Uh, you know, one stands out, the Atlanta tent meeting, which he's going back this summer. I clearly remember sitting on the front row of that, this lady coming up, being pushed in a red wheelchair, um, and, and being pushed to the front and, and told the testimony, I haven't been able to walk. You know, like, I, I literally cannot stand up from this wheelchair. They have to help me every, do everything I do. And, you know, he just, in the way that he does, he was very joyful about it. He says, well, that's going to end tonight. And, and he prays for him, and, and, and she just gets up out of the wheelchair, and then she starts, she starts pushing the wheelchair all over. I remember in that same meeting, there was a guy, and he knew this by the word of knowledge. He said, I believe the man's name was Marvin. Uh, he said, Marvin, you've got, and the Lord shows me this, You've got a, uh, a past injury that something went wrong and someone shot you in the back of the head and it's caused problems throughout your body. And, and Marvin starts to freak out. He's like, bro, how'd you know that? And he, and he shows the scar where like a bullet had lodged into his brain and it stopped Crazy. all motor function. Like he couldn't walk the same way. And he knew it by the word of, word of knowledge and prayed for him. And they're doing the testimony afterwards. And Marvin's telling about, you know, like I can walk perfectly. And, and the guy who's running the camera goes, show us the scar. He turns around. He like points. It's right there. Cameraman goes, what scar? He's like, it's right there. It's like, there's no scar there. And wow. he starts freaking out. He's like, what do you mean? You know, and so it's those moments that hmm. a young person sees. And I was, that was eight years ago. I was young. I was, you know, 
it's those moments that I saw. I was 11 years old. I saw and I thought, that's, that's, that's it. That's the Bible. If you don't see things in front of your eyes that happened in the Bible, you, you're looking in the wrong place. You're at the wrong church. You, you're listening to the yeah. wrong guy. Because God right. never stopped doing it. And it's not that people aren't hungry for the word. They're not hungry for dead, dry religion. Who in the world is? I'm ready to walk out of any place that's trying to be dry, devoid of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul even said, in the last days, there'll be people who have a form of godliness, but yep. deny the power. What does he say to do with those people? Teach Turn them away. about, actually, no, he says, uh, you know, like teach them, show them that like continuationism is actually true. And if you look through the sure. church, no, he says, don't have anything to do with those people. That's right. Don't have anything. You've got to have a disgust in your spirit for dead, dry Christianity because that's not what Jesus paid for. That's right. And it's really a demonic ploy because if you start thinking that people don't want to hear you, yeah. first of all, you're never going to have anything in the anointing, like a confidence or a boldness. Right. Neil Osborne used to say when he would do crusades overseas in like fully Muslim areas of Africa, yeah. He said that before he would get up, because, you know, it's one thing to be in a Pentecostal Southern American church where everybody's like shouting you down. It's another <laughs> thing to go into a Muslim invade, like a uh, dominated region where you just have a bunch of people with their arms crossed looking at you. And, right. you know, they came here because you promised them rice. But now, like, you know, <laughs> what, what's this? Is this a grab? You know? Yeah. So he, get, he said, I used to get up and he used to tell himself before he got up to, to grab the mic, he said he would say, I have what the people want, and the people want what I have. I've got what the people want, and the people want what I've got. Man, the, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because in it, in it, not in your opinions, not in uh, what you learned as you watched the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings last time you ran through the marathon. <laughs> not, you know, you hear some of the stuff that's being preached today. It, you know, like you said, it's no wonder people don't want to hear you because you're you're getting your doctrine from Halo and your sermon series <laughs> analogies from The Godfather. <laughs> you know, like I I, I don't want to. Nobody wants to hear that. They, they don't. They, you actually be surprised at how much people just want straight truth. Yeah, and not your spin on truth that makes it more palatable and sugarcoating it so that it's easier to swallow. People just, you know, there's that scripture, better is a rebuke. A, a man who rebukes another will find more favor afterward than he that flatters with his tongue. Mm. A man who rebukes someone else will find more favor afterwards than one who flatters with the tongue. Uh, if, if you study Gen Z and stuff, they're they're a blank slate. They're really a clean slate. They're a, it's a blank document. You can really and they get irritated. Actually, I was talking to someone before. They actually don't want to be preached to by people who are very very religious. They mm. they actually turn away from not like holy. I mean like right. they they don't want a Catholic priest ministering to them. The whatever the the, the, the catechism catechist yeah, yeah. They, exactly they 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 just want the raw dog word of God spoken to them yeah. that that type of preaching that like in your face type of preaching because you think of it you know how the devil is trying to use that generation for his purpose look at Antifa mm. they're not quiet yeah. cute and tamed and clean. <laughs> They they're, they're yeah. throwing bricks into windows, you know, right. they're they're revolutionists. Yeah. But we need to raise up revolutionists for Christ. You know that that that's why I really believe that that movie, the Jesus Revolution and all that mm -hmm. history of uh, whatever that guy's name was, uh that he brought that move of God, really was a move of God that that happened. Yeah. All of that, I really believe it's being brought up again, being yeah. brought to, fresh into our memories because I think that God doesn't want to do the same thing that he did in the 70s. He wants to do something even greater, but I believe that word revolution, revolution. God wants to have a revolution in society. Revival brings revolution. That's right. Revival, if you study the book of Acts, it, Paul, everywhere he went, you can highlight it. I actually have it highlighted in my Bible. Uproar, uproar, <laughs> uproar, yeah. uproar. Right. There's constant uproar. Everywhere yeah. he went, there was an uproar. There was, there was a riot. 
Right. Right. They were either rioting because they loved him or rioting because they wanted to take his head off. But yeah. there was a riot. There's if you a guy, think, like, Russell B. Johnson. I know you know him. Yeah. Um, and evangelist Ted knows him too. Russell B. Johnson out in Seattle to, to plant his church, I think in Snowmohish, Seattle or, or Washington, to mm -hmm. plant his church. He literally put out a Facebook post. We're meeting at this corner on this street this Sunday, 930. We're going to march down that boulevard to the mm -hmm. building that we acquired. And we are going to cut the ribbon. And that's going to be how we start the church. That's how we're going mm -hmm. to plant the church. Well, that Sunday at like 9 a.m., they had people there with torches. <laughs> Did you see the video? <laughs> I they haven't, People no. there with fire. They had people with like posters. <laughs> They were. It looked like you couldn't tell whether it was like a a rock concert or people that were starting a church. Yeah. It was that like rambunctious. Like they were. They marched. They paraded through the city. They made noise. Mm -hmm. They made noise. Acts chapter two. When this sound occurred, the multitude came running together. I believe that that's that's what's going to happen. There's going to be a a, a, a noisy. Christian generation. I know they have this book called The Last Christian Generation. No, no, no. I think there's going to be a noisy Christian generation that's going to rise up, that's going to, that's going to sound an alarm, that's going to make noise, that's going to disturb religion. Yeah. That's going to, you know, when Jesus traveled and, and ministered, he made noise. People were, yeah. pe the, the religious people were irritated by him, but even Herod heard about the miracles that he was performing. They thought John the Baptist had risen from the dead. Politics, it influenced every sector of society. You know what irritates me a lot, Alex? Is when you have people my age and your age, and uh, they have a sense of purpose, they have a desire to like change their world and all that, which I believe yeah. is a God-given desire. Right. But the way they're trying to go about it is through activism. Mm. They're trying yeah. to do it through activism, trying to do it through, you know, joining a cause. Right. BLM, joining yeah. another cause, you know, fight for the white uh, polar bears or whatever. They're, they're, they're right. trying to do something for the earth. They feel a, a, a sense of duty, responsibility. But the way they're going about it is through activism. You know, I'm not against going in front of a Planned Parenthood clinic and picketing the thing and convincing women to, to not go in. That's great. That's great work. But the best way to destroy the abortion industry in a nation is just yep. by taking the seed of the gospel, like yep. we've been talking about all night, getting that gospel into people's hearts. That's what's going to change the people. Legislation. Look, if you make abortion illegal in one state, they're going to go to another state. You make it illegal That's in a exactly nation, right. they'll go to another nation. You make it right. illegal on the earth, they'll do it with a, they'll do it with their own they'll have underground clinics doing it it's yeah. it's 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 not about just the laws and i'm all for righteous laws and righteousness exalts a nation all that but ultimately unless someone has an encounter with the power of the gospel to change their hearts all of it is in vain you know the gun laws we need to get rid of guns they'll can't use this a rock yeah can't use the rock that guy in spain three years ago he used the car Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Not not to like cut you off, but I mean like that's jump, jumping in my spirit too because you can't legislate salvation into someone's heart. That's right. It changes nothing. You can't do it. It's like in my hometown of Virginia Beach, Virginia, in the uh, in the states, there's this, there was like this news article that came up, and it was like this big uproar throughout all of this uh, all of the Virginia Beach City public schools and and the surrounding areas that. The Satanists have gone into the schools, like multiple middle schools and high schools and even elementary schools, and started their own Satanist clubs, and people were attending it. It was growing and stuff. And so all of this is happening. Parents are outraged, you know, conservative parents, Christian parents are outraged. It's growing. And so there's this counter move that, that comes on, and they're saying, like, we've got to ban these Satanist clubs. We, we, let, let, let's ban them so that they can't meet, you know, they can't group together, because it's obviously evil. And when I heard about this, um, and my, my mom actually wrote a, a piece in the paper about it, when she came to me and told me about what was going on, you know, like this counter movement, we need to ban these Satanist clubs. And she told me about these Satanist clubs. She says, like, you know, like, what, what do you think about that? I said, you know, it's good. Let them meet. You know, like, what are we going to do? Like, you know, you can't, you can't 
ban them and be like, all right, now ex- say this after me. I, I accept Jesus in my heart. It's like, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Let the Satanists meet. It's totally fine. Let them meet. The thing that we do is not, we don't, we don't conquer through politics. We don't conquer That's through right. policy. We conquer through the gospel. What parents should be doing is not being outraged about, you know, the Satanist clubs and what they're doing. Why don't you start your own club? Why don't you start a Jesus club in That's your right. school and watch how quickly, just, just in the same way in the book of Exodus, how the, the magicians of Pharaoh, they cast their, their rods down. It became a serpent. Moses also cast his rod down. It became a serpent. So you, bo- you see powers competing, but what happened? The Moses serpent swallowed up the other two. That's right. Yeah, the devil might be making noise, but when the gospel, the raw gospel of Jesus Christ comes into a school, comes into a region, it completely obliterates the plan of the enemy. So That's instead right. of complaining like about what's going, you know, like let's ban this. No, no, no. If they can meet, that means we can meet. Also, if you're in the states, like that's a futile effort because if you try to ban one club, if they, if you're going to suppress their speech, they're going to suppress your speech. So you know, let the, let them speak. Don't understand. People don't understand the First Amendment. Let them speak, and then your your words have an anointing on them. So just use your words and right. and use it in the way and. Use it in the way that you were created. You don't have to put on this phony, it's kind of like what you said, like people have a heart to do something, but then they feel like they have to put, the, put on this phony per- persona of like, oh, you know, I'm speaking the word of God. So, you know, when I do an Instagram video, I have to have like this calm voice and hey guys, uh, <laughs> I just, the Lord is speaking to me in my heart. Uh, you know, like everyone just turn to your Bible. It's like, that is so fake. People can, it's if irritating. you talk like one way, just talk the same way. Yeah. You know, God has anointed you. You know, and so don't put on this fake persona. If you get passionate, get passionate. One of my friends came to see you uh, preach the other time when you were in New York. Sure. And she, she had never heard you preach before. And it was so funny. I was laughing so hard because I was like, did you enjoy it? You know, she was like, it's definitely interesting. I've never heard someone preach like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, well, that's good. You know, it's like, don't put on this fake religious thing. People are looking for power. Be the power. That's right. You know, I'm reminded of the Satanist convention they had in Boston yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And exactly that. That's exactly what happened. You had a bunch of Christians complaining about it. You know, they actually had zero. They had no. Uh, uh, they rented out a convention uh, hall within the Marriott in Boston. Yeah. And I heard that they had less than 100 people show up. Oh, that's powerful. And that's with <laughs> every Christian on planet Earth reposting it and marketing for them. Yeah, Oftentimes, right. Christians are doing the marketing for the devil. Right. You know, like for the Grammys and stuff. I, I don't watch the Grammys. I don't watch award shows anymore. Uh, and and, and it's Super Bowl halftime shows. It's like, <laughs> I, I would not have known what happened had it not been for every Christian posting about it. Exactly. I would not believe? have seen that <laughs> halftime show. I wouldn't have seen, uh, what's that guy um, that did the Grammys? The, the guy that calls to himself honest, a fisher them. <laughs> I have no clue. Anyways. I'm the same as you. I've got he, no clue. He, he wouldn't it. say, the guy's like, I heard you like fishing on an interview. And then he's like, yeah. Um, I'm, he's like, uh, I, I've also, uh, he said something about like, I, I've considered actually, he wouldn't say fisher men. He'd say uh, fisher a fisher person. them. Fisher, Fisher them, though. <laughs> because of the, the gender. It made me you laugh. be gender neutral. But that guy, he did this whole Grammy performance that everyone was up in arms for. It's like, let them, sinner sin, fish swim. That's exactly uh, Birds right. fly. Cars yeah. drive. Right. Sinners sin. Unbelievers unbelieve. They don't believe. Yeah. That's, that's just, right. that's how they are. You can't, unless the gospel touches them, they're not, you can't convince them. You can't convince them otherwise. And so this Satanist convention, uh, which we wouldn't have even known about if it wasn't like plastered on every Christian news network. We need a break. Uh, they they weren't even, curse. this is the, the global Satanist convention. Just to show you how pathetic the devil is, just to show you how weak he is. You know, in Exodus 1, I was reading this the other day when I was preaching in New York, and it hit me so strong in my spirit. It says, Another Pharaoh rose up who didn't know Joseph, nor the God of Joseph. And it says that when he saw the Israelites, he recognized that they were too powerful for Egypt. And that they were multiplying too strongly. That they were too strong for him. So he decided to double down on their labor, their daily labor and their daily task. But notice, Pharaoh, who's a symbol of the devil, he recognized that the people of God were too strong for him. That they would prevail against Egypt and against himself. That he, he had no chance to prevail against them. That shows you something. The devil knows he's got his work cut out. 
The devil knows that greater is he that lives in you than right. him that is in this world. The devil knows that there's more firepower in the believer than there is in all the hordes of hell put together. The devil knows that the man with God stands in the majority. But That's what right. does he try and do? He tries to give you the grasshopper complex, the grasshopper inferiority mm. complex. We're outnumbered. Right. Yes, the land is good, but we can't. The giants are too big. The fortified walls are too big. The, 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 the armies are too much. The, the, the generation's too far gone. The people yeah. don't want to hear it. All these dumb confessions. People don't want to hear that anymore. People don't. Yeah. All that dumb confession is to get you away from how easy it really is to have revival onto the complexities and the challenges yeah. and all that. That's so right. I pray I mean, that it's... this broadcast, at least this does one thing to you, is that it shifts your perspective, puts the perspective of faith, the faith filter on your eyes, that when you look at the generation, you're not seeing them as people who are doing all right without God. You look at them as people that are sheep without shepherds, dispirited and distressed, and something rises up in you like it rose up in David, where he served his generation, and he said, I, uh, far be it from me, even when I'm gray-headed and old of age, God, don't forsake me until I've shown your power to these people and thy mighty works unto everyone who comes. That's been the cry of my heart. I know that's the cry of Pastor Alex's heart. And I pray that becomes the cry of your heart where there's a, 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 an inability to just settle. I'm not settling with the devil. I'm not saying, okay, you can have them, but just keep, no. I'm not settling. I will occupy until Jesus Christ comes. 2 Thessalonians 2 says, we are the restraining force on the earth. We restrain the devil. He's not restraining me. I'm restraining him. He's not in charge. I'm in charge. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm at a place of authority above every power and principality. I've got the keys of the kingdom that I can bind and lose. He's been stripped of his power. He's been stripped of his authority. I'm not under his feet. He's under my feet. I'm not subject to him. He's subject to me. I'm not being pushed around. I'm doing the pushing around. That's right. And so when you get that, when see, it's actually, it's actually impossible to... Speak these dumb confessions when you have a dominion mindset. Yeah, that's right. It's actually impossible. You actually, you, you can't even let it out of your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you understand in your heart the dominion mandate of the believer, when you understand that you are the head always and not the tail, when you understand that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, that though the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, the Bible says he cannot touch us for God's seeds abide in us. When you understand that, you become a wrecking ball in the hand of God. You're not going to repeat what the devil wants you to repeat. You're going to, when men are saying there's a casting down, you'll be the one to rise up and say there's a lifting up. Exaltation yeah, is coming. Right. My generation shall be saved. Gen yep. Z shall encounter the raw fire of the Holy Ghost. My generation is going to see the miracle working power of God at work in, in mighty signs and wonders and demonstrations of the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Man, that's so powerful. It, it, if that doesn't jump in your spirit, and I know there's, there's so many people watching you right now, and, and that jumps in their spirit. Because, I mean, you can't, you can't be full of the Holy Ghost and, and not feel like a spirit of war come on you. Like a spirit of, like, I, I don't care what the devil's doing. Like, get, like let's, let's tear down his kingdom. The violent right. take it by force. That kind of anointing. If you're feeling that right now, and I know you are, there's many young young. Uh, ladies and many young men who are maybe sitting in their room right now and that jumps up in your spirit. I know the feeling, trust me. That, that jumps, like, I got to do something. Do something. This isn't something where we're just like waiting on God to then just like sovereignly send revival. Ha You're the revival that he sent. The That's believer right. filled with the Holy Ghost is what God sends. He doesn't send Come this, on. This, this cloud of revival. And, and that was one of the things we talked about in is uh, the, the the whole uh, Lord, Lord send, revival. send revival? There's that there's that song. Lord send revival. Lord send it now. It's like it, it it irks me because God doesn't send revival. He sent revival two thousand years ago. Now He That's sends right. men and women filled with the Holy Spirit. He's That's deputized right. you to be the revival. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, 
and quickens your mortal body. So you've got to have the mindset of not like, God, just send revival. I pray you just like send it now and, and there's people just come into the church. Instead of thinking that, think, thank you, Lord, that as I walk into the grocery store, revival just stepped into the grocery store. As I walk That's into right. my public school, revival just stepped into my public school. As I go into my church, revival just stepped into my church. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you to make a move in your generation. He's waiting on you to take the deposit that he's given you and, and, and do something with that deposit. The Holy Spirit doesn't come upon someone or anoint someone to complain about, you know, talk about, give your opinions about revival. The Holy Spirit comes on someone to, like Peter, stand up and with a loud voice right. shout, men of Galilee. Like, it's a spirit, he's a spirit of action. And revival's not this, this thing that's coming. I, I, don't, I don't like, revival's coming, I'm, revival's coming to America, we just need to Come pray on. about revival. No, 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 there's no date on the calendar called revival. There's a person called the Holy Spirit, and that's what Hallelujah. he does. I mean, how many times evangelist TJ, and I, I, I'm not talking about anyone specifically, but I'm sure this has happened to you, where you, maybe you're, you're in a meeting, and, you know, like, it's going great, it's packed to the brim, you know, like people are getting saved, people are getting healed, people are getting delivered, like all these testimonies. And then you have someone come up on the mic, slowly strumming a, a guitar and be like, Lord, we just pray for revival. It's like, what all do right. you think we're doing? Like, <laughs> what do you think we're doing right now? That, this is it. Like people are That's getting right. saved, people are getting healed. Let's go in this flow. Like what, I, I, I don't know what people are waiting for. It's like they're waiting for like some sort of like misty cloud to come the, out. The glory cloud or like gold yeah. dust to appear on their fingers. I, I see it. Do you see it? Is that oil? I see it. It's like, mm. no, revival. You is ate when, popcorn. Is, you ate popcorn. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. You put too much, too much butter on your popcorn and now you see an oil. It, it's like <laughs> revival. And I'd be interested to hear, and, and I mean, like, but the definition of revival, if someone asked you, what is revival? I'd be interested to hear, I mean, because you, you obviously, you, you're a man that carries revival. Like, if you watch Evangelist TJ, and, and you guys know because you, you've watched Evangelist TJ, he carries revival. It's those types of preachers, that, I mean, the, those types of meetings that, that break the power of the devil. And so I'd be interested to hear from you, like, what, what you would say is, is the, a definition of revival. I think the simplest way to define revival is Jesus coming to town. Mm. That's the simplest way. What is revival? Is Jesus coming to town? It's the yeah. Holy Ghost in action. Revival, mm. I mean, there's different characteristics. I've done broadcasts on this, like different fruits that are the, yeah. pro the, pro the produce of revival, such as like repentance, miracles, um, people getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 8 is a perfect demonstration or a perfect story about a, like a biblical revival and what revival looks like. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, Paul went to Ephesus, lays hands on 12 believers, gets them filled with the Holy Ghost. Within 12, two years, the whole of Asia hears the word of the Lord. And then in verse 11, God begins to work extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to those that were sick and demonized. And the sick were healed, and uh, those that had demons were, were delivered. And there was great joy in the city. And the Bible says that people brought their magic books, astrology books, and they burnt it in the sight of them all, confessing their deeds. They were baptized, and so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. I think that's mm. what it is. That's a I mean, I don't think. That's a biblical revival. Right. It's the word of God so mightily grows mm. that it prevails. And here's the, here's the thing, is that people think that... And this, I would say, is another dumb confession that blocks revival. Revival is a sovereign move. No, it's not. <laughs> nope. It's not. Revival is heaven's response to the desperate faith and hunger of men. Yeah. That's what revival is. Revival is heaven's response to hungry men and women of God that, are, that aren't content with just status quo religion that aren't content with like pastor alex said holding to a form of godliness and denying the very power thereof revival right. is when you start to get in your heart what david carried where he said as a deer panteth for the water creek so my soul panteth for thee to see thy power in thy sanctuary as it is unto this day and like pastor alex said we're, we're not waiting for god to send it the great news is that you carry it that's why paul told timothy 
He said, don't wait for the gift to drop on you. You already got the gift. Yeah. Now you have to steer up the gift of God that is on Come the on. inside of you. Steer it up. Steer it up. How do you steer it up? Prayer steers it up. The word of God steers it up. Soul winning steers it up. You show me a soul winner and I'll show you a person who's not dry in the faith. It's impossible exactly to be dry. Right. And always, in a, I'm in a wilderness, brother. You can't be like that if you're a soul winner, an addicted soul winner. You look at right. Smith Wigglesworth, who was a soul winner in his day. He said, when the Holy Ghost doesn't move me, I move him. Hallelujah. Mm. Man, I love that. Man. When the Holy Ghost doesn't move me, I move him. He wasn't being arrogant. He wasn't being uh, insensitive or irreverent to God. He was showing us, a, a, he was showing us something. That it's not about feelings. Revival is not even a feeling. Revival is taking God at his word. And, yeah. and just letting it rip. Revival is simply, it is simply being the hands and feet of Jesus wherever you go. Yeah. Where he says, minister to that person at that Walmart. Oh, I don't know what he'll say. Who cares? Your job's not to command what he says. Your job is just to deliver the message and pray for the people. Well, I don't That's know. Exactly right. I, I, you know, I don't want to look stupid. You look. You already believe that there's going to be a day where you're going to magically just vanish into thin air and be caught up into yeah. clouds forever. You yeah. already believe that 2,000 years ago, there was a body in a tomb that jerked back to life. You've never been to Jerusalem. You've never even seen the tomb before. You've never, you know, you've never gone on a tour. You don't even know if the tomb is even there. Like you, you're right. taken up by faith. You already believe that there is a, a big creator who spoke the world into existence. The world already thinks you're nuts. The world already yeah. thinks you're crazy. The world already, Paul said, I will be counted a fool for Christ. Paul said that, that the gospel, the message of the cross, it is foolishness to them that are perishing, but I'm not gearing my efforts to those that are perishing. I'm not going to yeah. dim down my intensity. I'm not going to, you know, put a wet blanket on myself. I'm not going to lower the revival thermostat in my spirit to suit the mm. lukewarm or those that aren't interested. I'm going to let it rip towards those that are seeking God, that are hungry for God, that if we don't get the message of the gospel to them, they're going to die an early death. If we don't get the yeah. message, we talked about it before, 55 to 70 percent of Gen Z is 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 openly admitted as having some sort of mental problem, anxiety, fear, depression, bipolarism, whatever it is. But 55, if we don't tell them about the Prince of Peace, if we don't tell them about the one who said, come to me all that are weary and heavy laden, nobody else will. Nobody else will. And you can't contract that work to somebody else. You can't contract exactly it right. to the pastor and evangelist alone. Our ministry, Pastor Alex, Evangelist TJ, Evangelist Ted, our ministries is literally to be directed towards the edifying of the saints for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is the reconciliation of this world to Christ. And that's you. That's you. That's your job. Not called, you say. Not called. I don't feel called. Not called. Not heard the call. Rather, you should mm. say. Put yeah. your ear down to the Bible and hear yeah. the groans and the sighs and the, the screams of mankind crying out for a deliverer. Crying out. The people of Israel were, were groaning and crying out for a deliverer and said, God said, I have heard your cry. I've seen your oppression. But he didn't say, I'm here. He said, I've sent Moses to deliver you. Yeah. In this last day, Obadiah verse 21 says that God is going to raise up deliverers. Deliverers. Mm. Deliverers. Deliverers shall come forth out of Mount Zion, which is the church. God yeah. is raising you up as a deliverer. You're not going to have a mundane, boring, check in at nine, check out at five. You're not going to have some, you know, reg you're not, there's, there's a guy called Watchman Nee who wrote a book called uh, normal Christianity. And in it, he talks about what real normal Christianity is. Normal Christianity isn't I go to church on Sundays and when the census form comes in, I check pre Protestant. That's not normal <laughs> Christianity. Normal Christianity is what you read about in the book of Acts. Yeah. And just his shadow falling on some people. That's what this generation, that's how Gen Z is going to be reached. Hey, Pastor Alex, one more dumb confession. Yeah. And I think you'll do good with this one. <laughs> Brother, we need to preach the gospel, and if necessary, <laughs> use words. Oh, Lord Jesus. Here's the thing, guys. The gospel is a message 
that has to be spoken. That's what the word message means. That's right. Jesus didn't come up to a city and just like completely silently just like stretch forth his arms so that people could see his love walk. No. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's right. The whole idea that, you know, I, I preach the gospel at all times, but if necessary, I use words. Is just, you might as well just tell people, I, 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 I don't either, I don't know how to communicate the gospel or I'm too scared. Here's the thing. Any sinner can be kind. <laughs> any sinner can be kind. That's not what marks a Christian is kindness. Not, God never actually asked you to be kind. Well, you know, I gave, I gave my uh, employee lunch today and she didn't have lunch and so I, I'm just <laughs> hoping that she sees the gospel through my actions. And maybe she'll think like, as I gave her that tuna salad sandwich, G God gave us Jesus. Like nobody's thinking that. You've no. got to tell people, you know, we've been grown up, like especially in America, we've been conditioned to think, oh, everyone already knows the Bible. Yeah. Everyone already knows the story. You know, God sent Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. He, but in, in reality, people don't know the Bible. That's right. You've got to speak it like it's the first time it's ever been spoken. When you go up on someone, like if you go to approach someone with the gospel, don't think, oh, they probably already heard this, and let me just like recap for you. You don't need to recap. You need to say what the Bible says. You're like, and, and preach it in a way, and it has to be spoken. You can't, how many know we're just here to love people back to life? It's like, yes, love <laughs> is a, I hate that, man. We're, we're not, I don't say love to death because we're, we're speaking life, amen, so I'm loving you to life. No, it's like the, the gospel, people need to understand there's something in their mind where they don't know. They don't know that they're going to hell. They don't know that the things that they're doing are sinful. People genuinely think that they're good people. People think, yeah, like I, I'll go to heaven, people, yeah. I'm a good person, you know, I don't lie all that much, you know, I'm, I'm a good person, so I should go to heaven, God probably thinks I'm, I'm good. People need to know, it's love that speaks, it's arrogance that's, that's silent. That's right. Arrogance says, well, I don't want to offend anyone, I'm just going to live my life in a way, and, you know, these are trigger words. That's arrogance, thinking that you, your idea is better than Paul. You know, like Acts chapter 8, Philip went to Samaria and showed the love of Jesus by just uh, walking in love towards no Philip went to Samaria and preached Christ unto them That's right. the word preach means to proclaim G God took the Forceful. foolishness of preaching and anointed it and says this is the means by which people will get saved how can they call on him in whom they've never heard how can they hear unless someone goes how can someone go unless they're sent That's right. the gospel has to be a message that is clearly laid out not with your life. It needs to be spoken. It, need, it needs to be clear that if a sinner comes into my presence, they, they've already been told. And it's not like I'm beating them over the head with the Bible, but they need to know. It's like, I will not be the guy that on the day uh, of, you know, when eternity comes, I refuse to be the guy that looks across the chasm of people that came across my path and knew me personally and looks across and said, I wish you told me, I wish you laid it out to me. Yeah. Well, now I'm, now I'm going to suffer in hell for eternity because you thought you were living your life in love and didn't, didn't think it necessary to plainly tell the gospel regardless of how I would have taken it. Let me just tell you, there's no one in hell now that wouldn't give anything that they could possibly have to go back, That's even right. if offended them, to slap their offended self in the face and say, you've got to listen to the gospel. You've got to listen to this man, no matter That's how right. it makes you feel, no matter how convicted you feel. There needs to be Christians that aren't silent anymore. This isn't the silent, this is, like you said before, this is a loud generation. If, if people can get up in arms and, and scream and cancel Aunt Jemima, they can <laughs> certainly get up and proclaim a clear gospel message. That's right. And it's not hard to do. That's right. You know, it's interesting that you said that because uh, when Peter had that, or the angel came to Peter, he didn't say, oh, sorry, Cornelius. When the angel came to Cornelius, he didn't, the angel didn't deliver the message. And then another stupid, dumb confession that you hear a lot of people say when they talk about revival is, Lord, we just said you'd, we just pray you'd send your angels, bring the harvest <laughs> in. Angels are not charged with preaching the gospel. That's exactly it, it, right. There's two types of prayers God does not answer. One, he will not answer a prayer asking him about something he already told you you have. 
Yeah. He already told you you have. Lord, bless me. You've been blessed with every spiritual yeah, every blessing in heavenly places. He's already right. answered that in Christ. So there's two types of prayers God will not answer. One, he will not answer the prayer that you're asking or requesting something that he already said you have. Two, he will not answer the prayer concerning something he's already told you to do. Yeah. He's already told you to do. You can't contract your personal responsibility to serve your generation in evangelization and evangelism to an angel. Angels are not charged or tasked to preach the gospel. You and I are. Yeah. Jesus turned to his disciples. And it wasn't just the 12. It was all of them. Before he left, he said, you're going to receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come on you. Why does the Holy Ghost come? Why does the Holy Spirit come on people? Sure, he comes to break bondage. Sure, he comes to, to, to give you the oil of joy for mourning and beauty for ashes and open up the house, uh, the prison doors and all that. Sure, 100%. He's going to do something in you and he's going to do something to you. But the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, his mission, he's the Lord of the harvest. His mission is the harvest field. You can't say, I don't care how much tongues you speak. If you're not out where the people are, I don't know if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. I don't exactly care if you right. speak tongues eight hours a day. If you're not out where the people are, if you're still fishing in your bathtub and you're not going out where the ocean of humanity that have yet to hear. You know, there's that parable I love. Daghir and Mills talks about it a lot. Talks about how Jesus says the master of the feast sent out his servants to send invitations to people. And one said, I have a you know, oxen that I just bought. Another said, I just got married. Another person said, I just bought a property. I need to go and check it out. They were, they were disinterested. Jesus didn't say, all right, we'll abandon this generation. No, he said, go now to the highways and the byways. Go to the lame, go to the broken, go to the maimed, go to the blind, go to the downcast and the outcast. Mm. And it, the word, the Greek word there is anakazal. Compel them to come into my kingdom. Anakazal literally means to compel with fervor. It, it means to do anything and everything. You know how Paul said, by any means some might be mm. saved? That's anakazao. Yeah. By yeah. any means. The love of God compels me. I'll be made a fool to men. If it means somebody. You know, I love how you brought up. I, I'm not going to stand on the other side of the chasm looking at somebody in hell who's begging me, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you let me know? Why didn't you warn me? You know, it's ultimately your desire for a very temporary comfort that is allowing you to overlook that person's eternal discomfort. That's your right. desire for a very temporary comfort. Yeah. That's causing you to overlook that person's eternal comfort, that uh, eternal discomfort. Become uncomfortable. Become yeah. uncomfortable. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your little cute Christian bubble. Yeah. If, if that's what you're looking for is a nice little cute life, white, pick, uh, life, white picket fence, you know, beautiful neighborhood, and, you know, keep your hands up. God, Jesus gave the parable. He said that man who built bigger barns to store up his goods so that he can eat, drink, be merry, enjoy life, be, be comfortable. He said, you fool, who's going to spend all that that you, 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 you just got and stored up for yourself? So that's is right. the man who is not rich towards God, but is rich only on the earth. You know, one of the greatest ways, that, and I, I really feel to end with this, and Pastor Alex, I want you to pray for the people for an impartation of that zeal and what you carry for Gen Z. I want you to impart it to the people, but one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself, life is essentially the period of time God is giving you to store up e eternal and heavenly treasure. Yeah. Don't live in regrets. <laughs> don't live in regret. <laughs> don't, right. live, don't be the type of guy who is... At 80 years old, if the Lord should tarry, you're swinging on your porch with your wife and you're looking back on all the years. Imagine if we had, imagine if we had done that. Imagine if we had sown that seed for that crusade. Imagine if we had, don't live with, the Bible says, and I really believe this is the tear Jesus is going to wipe away from our eyes. It says that in Revelation 20, that he's going to wipe away all of our tears and you say, behold, the old things are passed away, all things yeah. are new. Why are we going to be tearing up? It's not going to be because people went to hell. 
because we're going to understand God's perfect justice. We're not going to be yeah. crying about it. We're actually going to, we're going to, the Bible says God is just. That's the song yeah. we're going to sing at that moment. God is just. Right. He's rendered to the, he's rendered justice. He's, yeah. he's balanced out the scale. He's, he's rendered his justice. We're not going to be crying because of that. We're right. not going to be crying because of all the pain we had on earth. That's not the tear we're shedding. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 that on that day, the fire is going to test the work the works that we've built up on the earth, whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stumble, stubble. The Bible says the fire will test each man's work of what sort of is, what sort it is, what quality it is. And it says the man who built on gold, who actually used his life uh, appropriately, he'll receive reward. But the man who built on wood, hay, and stubble, though fire will burn it up, he will suffer loss. Yet he might be saved, yet, yet not so as through fire. I believe that it's the loss. It's the looking back on everything we built, all the things we, we ex exerted energy towards, spent our resources on that literally provided 60, 70, 80, 90 years of temporary pleasure, that there's going to be a lot of people that Jesus is going to have to come and wipe away their tears. Because yes, they were saved. Yes, they were made, made, made heaven. But is that what you want? You just want to make heaven? You know, Charles Spurgeon used to say, if you have no desire to see other people saved and your generation shaken, I wonder whether you yourself are saved. If yeah. you have no desire to see other people saved, I wonder whether you yourself are saved. I believe that as Alex prays right now, that desire, like Paul carried, the love of God compels me to preach to this people, to, 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 to announce to another generation that Christ is alive. I believe that that's going to be imparted into you as you watch as, as you listen and open up your heart to receive, as Pastor Alex prays, take it away. I want you, if, if you want this fire, if you want this urge, this, this boldness to reach your generation, and I know it, it's been jumping in your spirit. I know, actually, and I don't do this a lot, I, I promise you, and I don't do this on broadcast, but there's a, there's a young man who's I think is 17, watching this in his room, and has felt the call of God to go into the ministry right now. And you've been wondering, is this me, is this God? God's called you into the ministry, and it's this, this fiery ministry that He's called you into. Take this as your call and go. Mm. But there's many other that are watching right now, and they're thinking, I, I want that fire for my generation. I want you to lift your hands. Receive this now. That same fire that, that came on me, that's the Thank Holy you, Ghost. Jesus. He's not special to me here, Evangelist TJ. So right now, Father, in Jesus' name, you see all the hungry people that want your fire, that aren't like these nominal Christians who just want to skate by and have a comfortable life, but they want your fire. They want your power. I pray right now that you baptize them and re-baptize them in the Holy Spirit and fire. Give them a fresh boldness to reach their generation. Hallelujah. Let us not be silent. Let us not be comfortable. Put us in uncomfortable situations with boldness to reach this generation in Jesus' name. Lord, burn out any lukewarmness that's in our spirit that would just have us uh, do the bare minimum. Put, put, put a, a disgust for bare minimum in our spirit. Yes. Put a disgust for average in our spirit. Mm. Lord, use us just as you said. Whom shall we send? Who shall go for us in the book of Isaiah? Mm. We say now, Lord, Lord, send us. We'll go for you. We'll preach the gospel. We'll cast out demons. We'll see the sick healed. We'll see the depressed set free in Jesus' name. Lord, use us in Jesus' name. We surrender our plans, our, our notions of how our life should be, and we, we present it to the gospel in Jesus' name. Lord, use us, every aspect of our life. Baptize us in a fresh boldness. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. I feel to pray for a fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost for some people watching right now. You've been asking God. You feel you felt like this, this specific fire for evangelism has kind of dimmed out. The Lord's going to baptize you afresh in the Holy Ghost right now. On top of your head to the soles of your feet, I loose the mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' mighty name, that dove, the Holy Ghost, doesn't just rest upon you. He lives in you. And Jesus, the Baptist, baptizes you afresh in the fire of God. You shall not be lukewarm. You shall not be apathetic. You shall not be indifferent. But a fresh love, a new love, your first love shall rise up from within you in Jesus' name. 
and you shall do the deeds you did at first. In Jesus' mighty name, I fan that gift into flame, clothed with power from on high, heaven's empowerment for heaven's assignment coming on you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be filled with the fresh oil of heaven right now. Your cup is running over. Not the old stale stuff. Fresh oil. I will be anointed with fresh oil. Yeah. And your cup shall run over. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, listen, if you're watching right now, you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to do that right now with me right here. Tomorrow's not promised. Jesus can come back at midnight tonight. But you know what is promised? Right here and right now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the most opportune time to be saved. There's no more opportune time than right now. Don't push this decision off one more hour. If you've never given your life to Jesus, or you have, but you've gone astray, you've derailed, you've gone distracted, you let the fire go out. You're no longer living for the Lord in the way that you know you should. You've left that first love. God wants to put a first love back into you tonight. He wants to fan that gift into flame, bring you back on track, divinely realign you so that you can run the race that is set before you uh, with endurance. If that's you, you've never given your life, or you have, but you'd like to rededicate your life today to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me from the bottom of your heart. Say this out loud. Say, Father... In Jesus' name, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess Jesus is Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me with your blood. I turn from this world. I repent. I turn to you. Fill me with your spirit. Where I was weak, make me strong. I will live for you. Heaven is now my home. God is my father. And I'm never looking back. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed amen. that prayer, I'd love for you to go on my website, salvationnow.ca slash, uh, no, no slash, just salvationnow.ca. The first link that pops up is I just got saved. Click that link. Fill it out. I want to get something to you free of charge. Uh, a little gift, Bible, some book, reading, reading material that's going to help you in this new adventure with Christ. Uh, go and do that now, salvationnow.ca. I just got saved. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we're going to send something to you as a way of welcoming you into the family of God. God bless you. Praise God. Stay connected with us by visiting us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching at TJ Malkanji. Or visit us online, www.salvationnow.ca. God bless you, and until next time.